All right. Hey, everybody. Jay Widener here. Um, thanks for watching. It's been a while. I've been gone. Springtime. Growing my food and uh, getting my uh, garden together and all that. And I uh, just wanted you to know that my uh, lawsuit that Corey Good sued me for $5 million was dismissed on April 1st, which is the my uh, day of the year, um, April Fool's Day, because I'm on the path of the fool. And 100% um, dismissed. So uh, I have new faith in the court system, which I did not have before. So uh, I'm really happy about that. So um, today I have a really interesting guest. I've been trying to get him on now for a while. And I think a lot of you are going to be uh, surprised that I have him on because you know that I'm a Kubrick aficionado, but I've always had problems with Kubrick, as you guys know. And, um, and I'm here today to discuss uh, the problems that I've had in the past with Stanley Kubrick. So my guest is Jason Horsley. Uh, hey, Jason, how are you? Hey, Jay. How are you doing? Good, good. So Jason is the author. He's the author of several books, but and they're all interesting. Um, but he's the um, author of a book called Kubrickon, which is a an examination of what you might call the dark side of Stanley Kubrick, and a really fascinating book, I thought. And um, uh, the way that you deconstructed Kubrick. It was just really interesting, and um, I really did appreciate it. I have, I do believe that Stanley Kubrick made great films, or I, I'm not going to deny it. I believe Paths of Glory is a great film. I believe that Dr. Strangelove is a great film. I believe even that 2001 is a pretty good film. But I do have problems with Kubrick after A Clockwork Orange. After Clockwork Orange, his movies seem to become something not cinematic anymore. And um, I, I personally believe that he got bored with filmmaking after A Clockwork Orange. I think he wanted to prove to the world after 2001 that he could make a low-budget, successful commercial film. And so he made Clockwork Orange. Then after that, it seems like he just kind of drifted off and he just kind of wasn't really even I'm not even sure he was making movies anymore after Clockwork Orange it was more like um experimentation what do you think of that well certainly yeah we converged there I mean, I'm familiar with your idea about Kubrick being bored with filmmaking from room 237 I always found it kind of amusing when you said that uh, although I actually don't mind Barrett and uh, something about it, even though I agree it's boring. It's, it's boring in an interesting way. Yeah. Um, but but to, to, put it. to to zero in on your uh, the main thing is the idea that Kubrick was making films as experiments is very central to the Kubrickon thesis. Yep. Um, uh, it's I mean obviously we have the idea of experimental film, but. I'm not talking about that, and I don't think you are either. I'm talking about actually using films and the art of film, cinema, imagery, and so on uh, in a larger experiment, in a sociological mm -hmm. and a parapolitical experiment, which uh, I'm tempted to just call it mind control, just to keep it simple and short. Mind control has sinister implications, and as you've said, there are certainly sinister aspects to what I look at. In the Kubrickon, I don't think there's any way to avoid if you're looking at a very powerful, socially, culturally influential figure, they're going to be affiliated with sinister agendas. But my main thesis is, is to do with, it's not necessarily sinister, uh, except for the context that it's, it's in, is to do with um, the possibility that Kubrick became, uh, during 2001, he became fascinated by the idea of artificial intelligence. And um, <clears throat> it was consistent with maybe a larger interest he had in terms of human consciousness and how it can be co controlled and programmed, which goes all the way back to at least the path of glory. 
but specifically artificial intelligence obviously is one of the main subjects of 2001 and how it could go horribly wrong. So as you know, the Kubicon thesis has to do with him, uh, the idea that he might have been uh, interested by that as a problem that was much larger and more compelling to him than filmmaking, uh, how, how to uh, discover a way to create artificial intelligence where it wouldn't end up like HAL and destroy human beings. So that's my thesis that he began making films not as a way to explore that primarily, although you can see that's also in the films he is exploring consciousness and how it can be programmed, but as a way to create artifacts which could be used um, to capture attention and to harvest that attention and to funnel it into what was at that time DARPA, but he, what he knew would eventually become the World Wide Web. So that's essentially the, the thesis that, mm -hmm. that he posited that artificial intelligence in order to really be effective and not be um, destructive to humanity would have to use human intelligence, human consciousness as its main uh, information source or energy source. Wow, that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, you you, you uh, have something in your book which I had discovered years ago, but I'd lost. I, I'd saved it on a computer, and then I think I'd, the computer broke or something. And I lost it, and that's the uh, Department of Information document that you have in your book, where the in the early sixties, six, early sixty four, I believe, they began looking for for some reason, the top film directors in Hollywood, uh, Billy Wilder, and I can't remember all of them. Hitchcock. Uh, Hitchcock, yep. And uh, Kubrick was on there. Oh, oh, Elijah Kazan, great film director. Um, and uh, Kubrick was on there. Uh, and, and, they, and they even make a, a, a special thing saying he's probably the most important one on the list, um, which is fascinating because this is early... This is before um, they've committed to going to the moon. Uh, NASA is a nascent organization at this time, hardly really doing anything, shooting some rockets up to the moon and all that, but not really a full-blown organization. And um, Kennedy has not called for uh, us to go to the moon yet. Oh no, he had. He had gone, had gone but they had not really got it going. And... Um, what I when I saw that document years ago, I started looking into um, the idea that Stanley was working for intelligence, and um, I connected it to the um, the film studio in Laurel Canyon uh, right. that Dave McGowan, my old friend, late great Dave McGowan, my old friend, wrote about in the Laurel Canyon series. And Kubrick was in L.A. He shot The Killing in L.A. And he shot Spartacus in L.A. He hated L.A. And I hated L.A. too. And um, he said one time that there was a nefarious cloud hanging over Los Angeles. And I, I'm wondering, you know, I, you, you, a guy with that kind of talent, no matter what you think of his films, he was a very talented guy, he would be taken in by intelligence. Um, there's just, I have no doubt about it. And I think that that document that you have in your book kind of proves that they were looking for somebody and they're using the Department of Information so that it would look kind of um, blase and not really important. But it was clearly um, the CIA or whoever would be looking for, you know, the top um, filmmakers for all sorts of reasons, not just for the moon landing. But all sorts of reasons. There would be all sorts of reasons that you would want to hire someone who could construct a scene or a reality for consumption by the masses. And I actually do believe that Kubrick was taken in sometime in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and the reason that he was taken in by intelligence was because he has one thing that none of those other directors have on that list. And that is that Kubrick was a self-made filmmaker, the only self-made filmmaker on that list. The other filmmakers are from the theater world. They all grew up in New York, or 
in, we were in New York or London, and they, except for uh, Hitchcock was not theater, but the rest of them were all theater directors. And Kubrick was the only one who actually knew how to work a camera, knew how to light, knew how to edit. Um, he knew how to do everything. And um, that's who you'd want. Um, as someone who is a self-taught filmmaker, I can tell you that you can't, when you're a self-taught filmmaker, you can't be fooled. No one can fool you. You know everything that's going on. No technician can tell you bullshit. You understand everything that's happening. And so you become like a, a different kind of filmmaker than a theater filmmaker would be. And uh, the technicians begin to have respect for you because you know what they're doing. And that's who you would want if you were going to hire someone to do some kind of intelligence operation. You'd want someone who knew everything about it so that they would be able to perform at 100%. And so I, I and, and Kubrick intimates in his films that he is kind of working for somebody. I mean, he does. And, um, and that's why I like your book so much because you don't like Kubrick, which gives you kind of a step away authority to look at his films in a way that most people just go gaga. And I, I admit I've gone gaga over Kubrick films before. And, but as I age and get older and look back at them, I like them less and less. It's weird. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what I thought was an exuberant thing uh, as I pull away from it and look at it more and more, I realize that there's a strange um, manipulation that's going on in all of Kubrick's films. And I uh, uh, now I don't like it that much. I don't want to be manipulated by it. You know, you, know, you, know, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, it's very central to, to the book Kubrick on because I do start from, you know, my attitude to Kubrick and the fact that I don't like him and the fact that I never really liked the later films particularly. I, I agree that earlier ones are more like um, and conventional is not the right word, but they had the kind of dramatic elements that I responded to. But the more he became more of an abstract filmmaker uh, and the more his reputation grew, uh, not that I was old enough, but I mean, during that period when his reputation was growing and his films were becoming more and more of these events, uh, th those were the films that I, I didn't respond to. So so for whatever reason, I had a certain degree of immunity to to Kubrick, the allure, what I call the spell of Kubrick. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I credit Pauline Kael, the film critic, because I, I was very influenced by her at a very young age. And she was also immune to Kubrick, the Kubrick spell, as not many critics are. But then most critics are male. And I do think there's something in this. Mm -hmm. The allure of Kubrick has to, it appeals particularly to a male sensibility. I agree with that. In fact, um, I don't really know hardly any women that like Kubrick films. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. my wife hates them all right so <laughs> it's a curious thing so and this is also uh central to the kubrick on thesis because um uh if kubrick was setting about to create films that were these artifacts designed to trap attention and to harvest a kind of conscious a particular kind of consciousness that i just call obsessive let's say obsessive consciousness um which has become much more obvious with uh, in the last 10, 20 years on the internet, the kind of obsessive attention that his films have attracted. Room 237 actually was kind of watermark in that yeah. development. Um, but the central to that, I posit, was uh, Kubrick's concerted effort over the years from about this same period, the mid 60s on, to create a myth around himself and his movies. There's no doubt about there's that. No doubt that, that that happened, but there's also no doubt if you look at it that he was he was uh, intentionally instrumental in that. It didn't just happen. Absolutely. He was definitely complicit with it, and and to a much greater extent than just a filmmaker who's vain, who wants to be seen as great. Like you could expect that from most filmmakers, most yeah. artists, they want to be respected, and they will try to big themselves up. But it was definitely more going on with Kubrick, yeah, and sure. it's. In the films themselves, I use 2001, the credit sequence, as a really obvious example, the way the planets line up and then his name. like It's just so right there and obvious. It's kind of almost a joke. 
Um, but in all his films, the, the time it took to make them, and uh, etc., um, the technical brilliance that is undeniable, and so on, the care that was taken in them, he was creating these artifacts that somehow cemented this legend that he was not just the greatest filmmaker, but somehow in a in a class of his own, and that this even extends to. It's a bit of a chicken or an egg, but it does extend to, to critical evaluations. Uh, the and the way that it's almost like there's no middle ground with Kubrick. You either yeah. love him or you don't get him, is how you'd say. There probably aren't that many people who hate Kubrick, but they just kind of they get left cold by him, right? Yeah, he's like a cold <laughs> fish. Yeah, I agree. And and um, uh, I wanted to uh, I I I had it prepared for our last interview, and I I, I didn't have it, but I had all of the credits the original credits for 2001, I was gonna read them and I misplaced the book since we got canceled on our last interview. But uh, if you, all the credits of 2001, when I saw the movie, there was like, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes of credits at the time and then they got removed. Now there's only like four minutes of credits, but uh, I have the entire list of the original credits. And here's who's thanked in 2001 Space Odyssey. Langley, Virginia, okay the Air Force Intelligence, Naval Intelligence, um, NASA, uh, every single aerospace company on Earth at the time, uh, Martin, uh, uh, Lockheed, every single uh, aerospace company is thanked. Um, they're all going to England to watch Kubrick filming, all of the heads of NASA, all of the heads of the CIA, all of the heads, and and you point out in your book, which I really liked, was that maybe they're not going there to have Kubrick do the moon landing or anything like that. Maybe they're going there to learn from Stanley on how to do things. And I actually think that that actually might be true. I think that 2001 might have been a, some kind of staging operation where he transmitted his filmmaking skills to the intelligence community. <laughs> and here's the thing. Um, uh, he took so long to make a film that it was ridiculous. And you have to wonder why that is and why it took so long and why all these aerospace companies and intelligence agencies are all being thanked. What, what, why are they being thanked? What did they do? I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that those credits at the end of the original production of 2001 are proof that Kubrick was immersed in the military industrial intelligence complex. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there's a documentary that I cite in the book as well about the making of 2001 that um, obviously points to this, but also to the whole corporate, I mean, the whole corporate uh, element behind the space uh, program. It was a, yeah. obviously it was a massive industry. They were trying to big up as much as possible. So, I mean, part of my thesis then here, using the specific example of 2001, is, is that... Uh, it, it, at the very least, I mean, without going into these deeper aspects, which are, which are much harder to to confirm uh, in terms of you know a fake moon landing, for example, at the very least, two thousand and one was was not just back, but even I think proposed in the early stages as a key um, element or artifact for the promotion of the space program. There seems to be no way to deny that. What, what I found when I was looking at that and presenting it before I published Kubrickon uh, was that Kubrick aficionados, because you know, 2001, is, is, it's been so raised up since that time. I think it's now the number one, it's considered the best film in polls by filmmakers, uh, Sight and Sound in the BFI, I think. Number one on number oh, no, two. Oh, no, it is. It's considered yeah. the best film by filmmakers, yes. The best film ever made, right? So it really has been raised up to the, the eye of the pyramid, you could say. And um, But what I found when I was 
looking at this evidence was that people who admire the film they don't care they say well that's not how is that relevant it's a great film just because it was you know some people saw it as propaganda kubrick was playing the system and he was doing his own thing and so on and so forth now that that to me is a kind of that's the kind of uh skewed logic or faulty reasoning that to me is evidence of a kind of obsessive attitude to Kubrick number one whereby he can do no wrong and even if he's backed by all these powers he's still somehow the one in control which is a kind of double thing but the other thing I wanted to mention is is that a lot of what I discover while looking at this stuff and talking to Kubrick fans and Kubrophiliacs and people who are doing their own research um, is is that uh it's very tricky to put it to words, but it's like the evidence of my thesis uh, is often there in the arguments people make against my thesis. So, for example, people who think that 2001 is a great Kubrick masterpiece, regardless of whether it's promoting space travel. Yeah, I think one of the only reasons that they can take that position is because they, they, they think that space travel is basically a good idea. And so you have to then take apart that myth. And, and you could say it's kind of subjective, but I wrote kind of half a book, Prisoner Infinity, about why the whole idea of space travel it, is a pernicious myth. It's not just a myth. It's a it's a very manipulative, seductive, pernicious myth. Yeah. And you know, my point of view is there's no good reason to go into space. That's, that's my point of view. But people who love 2001, they, they don't recognize that part of the reason they think going into space is such a great idea is 2001 so it's a sort of circuit you see what i mean they'll defend 2001 as propaganda because they think space travel is wonderful and they think space travel is wonderful because 2001 and star trek and all these other things that were influenced by 2001 have made them so so kubrick's influence is is, is astonishingly profound deep it really goes very deep and to me that's that is the evidence of like the Propaganda that's effective, we don't we don't identify as propaganda. That's the thing. It's easy to say this is propaganda, but but the real propaganda we think it's art. Well, you know, this goes back to um, uh, Germany and the nascent rocket program that Werner von Braun was in, and they actually hired Fritz Lang to do a mock up of a, a rocket launch. It was a model, and they they shot it down through a tube and then they reversed the film to make it look like it was going up and then they right. showed it to hitler and hitler funded the entire german space program based on a film that wasn't real that they, they said was real that fritz lang the famous german director directed and then Werner von braun who was behind that came to america and then he worked with Walt Disney. And again, they created another piece of propaganda for, with Walt Disney in the 50s promoting the space program that was all based on models and fake stuff and not nothing real. And then again, that permutated into 2001 a Space Odyssey, where now we are a big budget, we got a big director, and we can really go for it. And the most important part of this is a uh, there's a documentary called a life in the pictures i think about stanley kubrick i haven't yeah. seen it in years but i saw it years ago and there's a very telling moment in that documentary where they interview the then head of mgm I forget his name now got a white beard and and all that and he and they say to him in this interview they say hey so you've got a big budget production going on in england a science fiction uh, movie. Um, it's your most expensive movie that you have going on right now. What's what's happening with that? And then he goes, um, I'm really not sure what's going on with it. I haven't really looked at it. I'm like, wait a minute. I worked in the corporate world. I worked in budgets and studios. There's no way in the world, a $10 million film in 1967, you're going to be watching every penny spent. And yet he doesn't even care. He gives a frivolous answer. Uh, which told me at, at that moment that this movie was not funded by MGM. It was funded by the uh, by NASA and Langley and Air Force Intelligence and all the people that had all of the credits at the back of it. And it was done for exactly the reason that you're saying. It was done for space propaganda. And the um, 
you know, what's what's interesting about 2001, which kind of goes over everybody's head, is that the astronauts are actually on a secret mission. Um, mm -hmm. They're not really on an overt mission. They're on a covert mission. And they don't even find out what the reason is until after they disable HAL. Uh, do they even discover what, what or Bowman discovers what that mission is. And that mission <clears throat> is to go to um, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, you know, out on Jupiter or in the book Saturn. And... Uh, and it just kind of blows by everybody's head that actually the entire thing is a covert mission from the covering covering up of of the discovery of the monolith on the moon by creating a, a pandemic uh, a, a rumor to uh, hiding what the astronauts are really going towards uh, in the mission. And so the entire thing is actually telling you that there's this space program and they're hiding everything from you. And it's in the movie and nobody sees it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, what I'm saying is, is that 2001 was created as a guide towards a secret space program, a secret covert program that has nothing to do with what we're being told. And uh, the purposes are really kind of unknown. I mean, maybe they are looking for extraterrestrial uh, evidence. I, I doubt that. Um, I think it's probably more like just to control humanity through satellites and, you know, all the other things. So. Yeah. Uh, well, because that was the subject of the film you made after it's got regarding it was all about controlling inner space. Right. And it's interesting that 2001 as space propaganda was also equally influential in terms of the psychedelic revolution and the counterculture. Like Good it became point. also like a cornerstone mm -hmm. of that whole thing, the ultimate trip movement. Mm -hmm. And as we know, you and I, and probably most of your listeners, the um, intelligence interest in psychedelics was anything but casual as it was one okay. of the central tools that they had for psychological control cultural engineering you name it That's uh, right. gordon <laughs> wasson who discovered the magic mushrooms in mexico he worked for the cia yeah well there's yeah I mean, we don't have to get into that whole history i'm assuming some familiarity with it it's it's a deep dark hole and i think I mean, I was going to say, T. Kubrick himself said he was against psychedelics for himself, uh, but it doesn't mean, I mean, he doesn't have to be consciously making a film to promote, promote psychedelics. He doesn't have to be aware of it, but somebody sure was, you know, with that light show ending that was yeah. basically incoherent, right? Nobody understood what was happening there. Kubrick eventually explained it. I just read it today, actually. I'm like, oh, that was what was going on, right? But it didn't matter because it was a light show and people took LSD. I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands did that, but oh. enough that there was this sort of meme or this idea that to really understand 2001, you needed to be tripping. That's right. right? And so that that also is a Trojan horse of a delivery device. In, in itself. Yeah, it's uh, one of those weird uh, coincidences. Like, um, so psychedelics were uh, reintroduced <clears throat> into the world in the 1950s. And exactly at the same time that psychedelics were being introduced to the Western world, um, we, we began having like hundreds and hundreds of UFO sightings and alien encounters. And, uh, and the aliens are saying the same thing that the psychedelics are saying, oh, you're ruining the earth. You've got to stop ruining the earth. And, and I've always been struck by that weird coincidence that exactly at the same time in history, two momentous events happened. <clears throat> psychedelics and ufos at the same and alien encounters all happened at the same exact time all seemingly pointing towards the same goal which is somehow that we're destroying the earth and we have to stop doing that and uh uh creating you know the environmental movement came out of this and uh feminism and all these other things came out of all of this and it's just kind of not no one ever looks back and goes huh I wonder what yeah. was going on back there. And again, I think you're right. And I don't believe that Kubrick 
uh, eschewed psychedelics. A, a highly intelligent person uh, at that time would have been very interested in psychedelics. It was, uh, all Kennedy was taking them, uh, uh, LSD, they were all taking it. Everybody was. Um, it just wasn't well known yet. And if Kubrick was working with the intelligence, well, we know the CIA bought, I don't know, what was it, 10 million doses of LSD from Sandoz in the late 1950s. Um, and they were gone when they went to go get them later. Uh, they were all, all 10 million doses were gone. I mean, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I would say that the intelligence agencies and the art world <clears throat> at that time was very interested in disseminating psychedelics to the, to the masses for whatever reason. I have no idea what the reason was, but they were. And I know that because I was there. And I know that it was very hip to drop acid and go see 2001. I never yeah. did, but I know people who did. Lots of people who did. So um, I think that your whole idea, and, and, and I think in the Kubrickon, 2001 is the most essential movie. Don't you agree? Yeah, it is. I mean, I talk about The Shining a lot. I think the triptych is, is The Shining, Eyes Wide Shut, and 2001. Those are the... Right, but I also got I mean Clockwork Orange for different reasons because of the deep background on that one. Um, but yeah, 2001 obviously is the head cornerstone of the Kubrickon in terms of his reputation, his legend, and all the rest of it. And it does seem to be the most influential movie that he made, but one of the most influential movies of all time, I would say. But uh, what uh, I point out in uh, my movie. Um... Uh, on 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 2001 is that it, it's actually based on the Kabbalah. Um, 2001 is a completely Kabbalah or oriented film. Uh, the central pillar of the Kabbalah, uh, Malkuth is Earth. Yesod is the Moon. Um, uh, Tipperith is Jupiter or Saturn. I mean, and then there's the Abyss, which is the light show. And then Kether, which is the sequence at the end in the in the weird hotel room. <clears throat> so Kubrick is evoking the uh, central pillar of the Kabbalah in the film. <clears throat> and he breaks with the uh, three-part uh, normal film and creates a five-part film, which is almost unheard of in filmmaking to uh, create a film in five acts, but he did. <clears throat> and I think that gives way to kind of the clumsiness of the movie a little bit, because um, it's uh, most people are uh, disoriented by 2001 when they watch it for the first time. They don't like it. Most people don't like it when they see it. I think it takes a certain kind of uh, mind to think that it was a great film at the first viewing. <clears throat> but a lot of people do like it. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, <clears throat> And then we get into... A Clockwork Orange, which is uh, this odd film where the protagonist is a psychopath that you somehow begin to like. And, and he is mind controlled through watching movies and taking drugs. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, the whole thing is this, this weird, strange contradiction of, of forces um, and you and uh, when I see two thousand or when I see a Clockwork Orange, I see a mind control by Stanley Kubrick. I see that Kubrick intended to make a movie where he would present a most despicable character imaginable and get you to like him, and and I think that was his goal in making two thousand uh, making a Clockwork Orange. Uh, I really do. I believe that his goal was to see if he could make you like Alex. I had a discussion for about 20 minutes with Malcolm McDowell one time and um, very interesting discussion. I brought this up to him and he said, that's exactly right. That's what, exactly what Kubrick told him was you're, I'm going to make you so charming while your acts are going to be so despicable. You're going to be the most charming, despicable villain ever presented in movie history and and uh, that's what Malcolm McDowell told me so 
uh, well, it reminds me a little bit of what Pauline Kael, who hated the film, said about it was that Kubrick was suck sucking up to the thugs in the audience. And well, I think I want to address that. Yeah. Because I have a, a personal experience with that. I went to see Clockwork Orange with four or five of my friends in, uh, it would be late high school. So we were all like seniors in high school. We all went. And we uh, we were uh, we loved the film. We came away from it. We're like, oh wow, that was a great film. And you know, I think we had some beers and talking about it and all that. And then uh, I really and truly, I watched two of the four people that I went to see the movie with. They turned into thugs after the movie. They mm -hmm. turned into thugs. They yeah. were arrested for uh, property damage and beating up somebody and. I thought, I thought, did they get influenced by that movie? I mean, I mean, I, I didn't want to be a thug, but they kind of, it kind of liberated them into being a thug. So I think wow. Pauline Kael is right. All right. Well, I was and, and uh, Kubrick pulled the film in England. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. He, he, he didn't, he didn't ban it, but he effectively prevented it from being distributed. Yeah. Because yeah. the film was designed to create chaos in society, and he knew it, and he did not want that film being shown in the place where he was living because there were actually droogs in London, guys dressing up like Alex and beating people up. I remember at the time that was yeah. on, actually not just in England, in America too. Yeah. Um this is interesting. It sort of occurred to me that I mean, I'm reading a book currently. It hasn't been published by Stephen Snyder, known as uh, Recluse, who's written a book about Kubrick, which is very interesting. And he goes into a lot of detail. You'll, you'll be interested in this because it goes into way more parapolitical stuff than I get into in the Kubrickon. And um, uh, uh, he, he posits that one of the ways that plot recurrence was being used was in tandem with experimental technology in cinemas, which is true of The Exorcist. It's pretty much come out now that, that some of the extreme effects The Exorcist was having on audiences were limited to specific theatres, right. thereby suggesting that some sort of technology is being used. So anyway, in his book, Snyder posits that plot recurrence might have been similar and that... Um, uh, that it was particularly that Clockwork Orange during that first run, the, the copycat violence was particularly centering around one particular theatre. So anyway, it occurred to me just now, mm. talking to you, that there might be something similar going on with your hypothesis about uh, Kubrick being somehow involved in faking footage of the moon landing, or at least aware of it, or yeah, useful to it, um, that he might have also been complicit with experiments that were being conducted with a clockwork orange. Yes. And that, you know, the, the, the sort of surface story about this, about Kubrick and clockwork orange is that it was somewhat cynical that he needed a really big hit yes. even after 2001 to really secure his position with the studio so he could do what he wanted with the Napoleon movie, which he never got to do. But anyway, he was really, he really needed a hit and clockwork orange he, he did it very cheaply. Uh, it was a massive hit. I think it was his big, biggest success proportionally anyway yes, to the bunker. It was. So, so there's kind of this view that, that Kubrick sold out a little bit with Clockwork Orange. It's certainly, of all his movies, it's the easiest to criticise as, as immoral, let's say, because I think it just is plain, you know, just plain immoral as a film. Um, so yeah. that's kind of the... That's a surface version, but there may be this deeper thing whereby he was selling out in these deeper ways by being complicit with the very kinds of mind control experimentation that the film was about. And when he became aware of how effective it was, he was also receiving death threats, I think, at that time. So, I mean, one of the problems we have, of course, is, is that we've only got a few of the pieces, right? And the pieces, they really point to this picture but it, it's it's easy to forget that they're not all of the pieces. So I'm sure there are other elements here with the Clockwork Orange, um, but even these ones that we're able to talk about, uh, they're extremely compelling as to this the overall thesis that, that Kubrick was involved over the years with a kind of 
long-term social engineering and, and experimentations yeah. in mind control. And you and you point out that Anthony Burgess, the author of Clockwork Orange, had intelligence uh, connections. Yeah. And one of the drugs that are being sold at the Molokai Milk Bar is Drencrum. Um, and this is from the book. Uh, uh, so uh, Drencrum, of course, is very close to adrenochrome. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to wonder what Anthony Burgess actually really knew. I mean, you know. All right. All right. Well, you have to wonder, obviously, of course, what Kubrick really knew. And I mean, one of my criticisms of Eyes Wide Shut, and you see, to me, I'm always interested in, in the deeper layers of, of conspiracy control and all this. And to me, the, there's always a kind of, it's almost like in, in, in gold mining, you talk about spiked ground where people put gold there to, to lure gold miners off the trail so they won't find the real pastry. I feel like that's going on in conspiracy circles all the time. And to me, Eyes Wide Shut is more like that. It seems like a massive big red herring. I'm not saying that there isn't, Kubrick wasn't doing something in there, of course, that was profound and to do with social engineering. And there's all kinds of you know, solid uh, evidence for some sort of um, conspiratorial elements. I just mean the idea that he was actually exposing the evils of the elite in that movie seems to me highly questionable uh, and it, it just made me think of it in terms of endocrine because if Kubrick knew the kind of things that were really going on in you know pre-Jeffrey Epstein circles of power and depravity and the board Polanski I think was directly centrally involved with and Kubrick was very closely affiliated with Polanski um, then Eyes Wide Shut is almost a mockery of that. Like the things he shows are so vanilla, essentially. That, and that's never really addressed, right? There's this idea that somehow he was killed because he was exposing the truth. Well, what truth, right? right? What's so shocking about Eyes Wide Shut? There are things about it that really are strange, but certainly it's not as an expose of elite criminality. As I say, it's mm -hmm. extremely tame. Mm, I think it's probably one of the most boring movies I've ever seen. <laughs> well, that, but that, again, that's what makes I mean, it even the even the sex wasn't even sexual. It was like I wasn't even titillated at all by any of it. I was like, you know, uh, you know, he always they say that he always wanted to make a a a, uh, a regular movie as a porn movie. I have no idea why he would want to do that, but um, uh, if that's porno, then. That's the most boring porno I've ever seen. So I don't know. It, it is interesting that he is. Um, okay. So there's this whole, I'm just going to get into it. There's this whole weird pedophilia thing going on in yeah. the background of Kubrick movies. And yeah. people don't talk about it. People don't talk about the fact that Arthur C. Clarke moved to Sri Lanka for reasons uh, we all yeah. know about now and that he openly advertised uh sri lanka as being a place to come to in his series on mysterious world um uh he uh arthur c clark wrote an article for i think the london times of advocating for legalization he was very open yeah by the way i was just i was actually just about to bring this up when you did have you heard I just read it in Snyder's book that uh, on his death, allegedly um, massive amounts of child pornography were, were seized at Kubrick's estate. Have you heard that? I hadn't heard that. Um, it doesn't surprise me, to be honest with you. Uh, well, then the other thing I hadn't heard was that on, cra you know, that site, Crazy Days and Nights? Yeah. Reports about Hollywood. Did you read the article about Kubrick in 2018? It has to do with... It has to do, I mean, it's very salacious and so perhaps we shouldn't really go on record, but but it has to do with him being sexually involved with Sue Lyons and using Sue Lyons to procure young girls. Anyway, it's very it's very damning in terms of... Around. I did read that. I did read that. Did read that yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. it doesn't mean it's true, but no, there's no doubt... It doesn't, but there, if the you look at the underlying, there's just these little things that are in every movie that are just disturbing. Like in Spartacus, the whole line about snails and... <sighs> okay, <laughs> well, I'm gonna go into something that I've not never gone into publicly. 
Um, if you watch, uh, AI is essentially a remake of Pinocchio, okay? Yeah. And if you go back and you look at Disney's Pinocchio, you will see that the guy who's procuring the young boys and taking them to Pleasure Island looks a lot like Charles Lawton, okay? In the Disney movie, okay? The 1931, maybe? No, not 30, yeah, 31, I think it was made. Um, he looks almost exactly like Charles Lawton. I'm not the only one to see it. A lot of people pointed out that that would look just like Charles Lawton. Is it, is it really called Pleasure Island? Yeah, it's called Pleasure Island. Yeah. Uh, and right, when, yeah when, when, in the movie, the, the guy procures about 15 boys. He puts them on a boat and he takes them to Pleasure Island. And on Pleasure Island, you can drink, you can smoke, you can play pool, you can cuss, and all of that. You get to do everything. But yeah. um, what's really going on in the movie Pinocchio is that the boys are being turned into asses and sold in slave market. That's the plot of Pinocchio, period. Wow. Go wow. watch it. Um, so AI is a remake of Pinocchio. Hmm. Okay. And um, when you think about it, um, he hires Charles Lawton to be in Spartacus. Okay, and he dresses up Charles Lawton to look just like the Charles Lawton that's in Pinocchio, the Disney movie. Okay, he gets in the long hair and almost the same clothing and everything. And then he turns Charles Lawton into kind of a pervert in the movie, uh, a heterosexual pervert, um, but a pervert. Uh, always talking about women and all this, which is kind of a mockery because Charles Lawton was well known to be not a lover of women in Hollywood. He was known to be, you know, gay and, and all that. And uh, then, so he does that in Spartacus and then he makes attempts to make Pinocchio again as a movie, he, di he dies before it happens. And um, I just find that really interesting that uh, the movie that nobody understands that Disney made which until you really watch it, you really don't understand what's going on in this movie. Uh, but Disney is exposing this thing and nobody sees it. And then Kubrick attempts to remake that movie. And you got to wonder what kind of movie he was really going to make. We don't know yeah. because Spielberg took it over. Now I was told I, when I came out with my, um, my analysis of 2001 in 1999, um, I got a call, it must have been around 2002. <clears throat> I got an email from somebody who said that they were an uh, assistant of Kubrick's and they didn't want me to know their name, but they would talk to me on the phone. And so I called them and we had about a two and a half hour amazing conversation that I couldn't record, but I was writing everything down as fast as I could. And he was definitely the real deal. I mean, I, I, he, he knew stuff that only somebody who knew Kubrick really well. I don't know who he was. He was an American, so he wasn't he wasn't Leon Vitale or anybody like that. But um, he told me that the script that Kubrick wrote for AI was completely different than the one that Spielberg had. And I said, well, what's the difference? What was the difference? And he said, well, just ask yourself, who would really want a perpetual 12 year old boy, right? And I thought, hmm, and, and, and he said, would a woman really want to have a son that never grows up, that never gets married, never goes to college, that's perpetually 12 years old? And I thought, no, nobody would want that except for one kind of person. And again, it's always in this films, you know what I mean? It's yeah. always kind of suggested, uh, or whatever, that there's this kind of sinister thing going on in the background. And yeah. it's always there. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's always there. Um, the yeah. scene in Eyes Wide Shut, where the Russian costume owner discovered, he looks down, he sees a pizza on the table, and he goes, what is this? Right? He sees the pizza, he 
immediately understands that something is going on. And then he walks over and there behind the couch is his, you know, whatever, 12, 13 year old daughter with two guys. Right. Yeah. And you're like, well, what is this all about? Right. And I think we can now conclude that that Kubrick was part of this elite. I think those were the best scenes in Eyes Wide Shut, actually, with the, with the young girl, which yep. indicates something where Kubrick's attention was most activated, perhaps. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about this way, talking about it, like, what does it have to do with, because I do get into it in the Kubrickon to some degree, and then, of course, there's Danny in The Shining, who is inferred that he's sexually Clearly, abused. Clearly, he was father. abused, yes. But, but also, where I wanted to go with this, because, I mean... I, I, I get into this in Prisoner Infinity. There's this weird convergence or overlap between pedophilia, child child sexual abuse, trauma, and and aliens, alien abduction, uh, psychic powers. This these two realms. They, they and psychedelics. Are, and psychedelics, yeah, um, and artificial intelligence, at least in the case of AI. So because Werner von Braun actually is a central figure in, in Prisoner Infinity. I mean, look at his his interest in artificial intelligence and so on. Um, and Whitley Strieber wrote about Werner von Braun. So there's just, I don't know what it is, but these there's some sort of nexus. And I think that the the um, well, the center of the nexus, it, you could say, is a child's psyche. It's something to do with hacking into a child's psyche through trauma, specifically sexual trauma, in order to uh, harvest and harness the, the psychic energy therein. This exactly. seems to be the, the core of the pathology. Absolutely, exactly. Therein. Danny was abused by his dad, and that's where he got his psychic powers from, in The Shining. There's no doubt about it. And um, this is a... Uh, Somehow they discovered this. I don't know how long ago, but they discovered that they could create psychic abilities through trauma. And I believe that is what The Shining is about. Not just the King book, but the Kubrick movie. And yeah. even more emphasized in the Kubrick movie over the King book. And, um, and I personally know someone who is a very good friend of Stephen King, and Stephen King told him that he thought my theory on Kubrick faking the moon landing and using The Shining as his confession was exactly spot on. So well, Stephen King agrees with me. <laughs> uh, but King famously said that about The Shining, that when he saw it, he thought that Kubrick was trying to hurt people with his movie. Now, maybe he was projecting, because I know that Stephen King felt that Kubrick was trying to hurt him. I think he was. But um, but, but but maybe there's also more to it. Um, oh, he... no, I think so. Um, uh, the Shining is um, Kubrick's 11th film. He's firmly established as a director at this point in his career. He's done everything that he wants to do. And The, the Shining is a multifaceted, multi-layered 4D chess of Kubrick securing his legacy. That's what I believe The Shining is. It's a complete an attempt by him to secure his legacy as a great filmmaker. And what he did is he added so many layers of stuff in the film that um, he knew that it would take years for people to unravel it. And he did it all on purpose. And it was all done way ahead of time, all done for uh, many reasons. And in fact, my next film is going to be going into some of those reasons. And um, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because I'm preparing a film right now with my buddy, Ryder Lee, um, on um, The Shining and uh, the various things that Kubrick was attempting to uh, say in The Shining. But The Shining is a creep fest. I hated it when I saw it uh, in 1980. I absolutely hated it. I, I came away, you know, I was a big Kubrick fan. I, I read the book and was really looking forward to Kubrick scaring the hell out of me. And I never got scared at all, not in the whole movie. I never, never felt, I like horror movies. I'm going to admit from the beginning, 
I love a good horror movie. I don't think anything accomplishes uh, cinema more than a really good horror movie. I just watched uh, The Invisible Man, the new version of The Invisible Man the other day. Really good horror movie. Just really good. Just to the T. Uh, scary the hell out of you. Shining doesn't scare me at all. The Shining made me want to take a shower, actually, after I saw it. Um, and now I realize that it's not a horror movie. It's a creepy movie. It's just creepy. Jack Nicholson is completely creepy in the movie. Uh, the scene where he puts Danny on his lap and I will never hurt you, Danny. That is like the creepiest scene in any Kubrick film. That one little scene <clears throat> where he has Danny on his lap is like, <clears throat> yeah, he is going to hurt you. <laughs> and yeah, I think that Pauline Kale is right. It is feels like a movie that does want to hurt you. Uh, uh, Stephen King. Stephen King has said that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I would like to talk to Stephen King about all of this. Stephen, if you're watching, you know, contact me. I'd really like to, call, you know, it can be in private, but I'd like to really hear what you have to say about all of this. We know that Kubrick staged the red Volkswagen being destroyed by the semi-truck during the snowstorm as uh, Halloran is going up to the uh, Overlook. And uh, that was definitely Kubrick, you know, giving Stephen King the finger. And telling him I, I'm in control of this vehicle, not you. I destroy your vehicle. Have you seen the image? Oh, yeah, it's in Kubrickon there. No, definitely no king sign on the yes. Side. They took out the SMO, no king. <laughs> that is funny, especially because Kubrick was a, a chain smoker. And so was Jack Nicholson, too, by the way. Uh, uh, it's uh, also, it's also, I mean. I, I put it in the book, not just because it's a funny joke about King and Kubrick, but it, I think it's 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 evidence, if evidence is needed, that Kubrick was playing these games, that he was planting clues wherever he could. Absolutely. And so, yeah, The Shining is has become uh, much more than 2001. It's become the Rosetta Stone in this particular field. There's not the critical community that reveres Kubrick, but the internet conspiratorial community that reveres Kubrick. Well, they've got eyes wide shut, but to be frank, as I say, eyes wide shut, shut is a bit of a dead horse. Like you can keep flogging it, but you're not going to get much out of it in my view. Whereas The Shining, you really can keep digging and keep digging and you will find more and more of these anomalies. But how do we know, as part of my, my thesis, how do we know at what point are we finding anomalies that weren't intentionally put there? Because, of course, they would just be naturally there. But if you put That's enough right. there, spike uh, Leon Vitale, I had a long talk with him. He doesn't like me very much. He was yeah. his top uh, assistant. I spent a couple hours with him uh, getting very drunk. And um, he told me that um, a lot of stuff he told me. But he um, he told me that all that was just mistakes, that Kubrick didn't really care anymore. Oh, it was. He thought that all of the stuff that I said was in The Shining wasn't really there, that the continuity errors were just Kubrick not caring anymore, taking so many takes that that he didn't care whether things matched up. And I thought, That's funny. Oh, that is amazing that you would admit that, right? Because well, I mean, yeah, it is funny that if he's trying to protect one thing at the cost of another thing, like yeah. decimating Kubrick's reputation in order yeah. to cover up it. Seems Very strange. Yeah. And he, of course, he got really mad at me. And of course, Kubrick's daughter really hates me. Because yeah. I, I said the thing about 2001, which I still believe is real, by the way. Uh, what people don't realize is that the we now know that um, that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were seen at the blimp uh, hangar north of London. There was a giant blimp hangar there. And it's now used as a movie studio. In fact, all of the Batman series by Christopher Nolan were filmed at this blimp hangar. It's this huge building. And it's 40 minutes away from where Kubrick lived um, yeah. in, in London. And... Um, the guy, the witness, said that they had decked out the entire blimp to look like the moon the hangar, had hills and, and everything, and, and that, that they were practicing their moon landing there. And to me, that's the uh, that's it. I mean, to me, that, that, that says that everything that Kubrick would want, he'd want it to be close enough to his home so he could get home at night and sleep. Uh, we know that he was famous for that. 
And uh, we now have a set that was big enough because that was the big criticism that I got from everybody when I came out with the Kubrick did the moon landing was that there were Shepperton studio didn't have a big enough set for that. So how could he have done it? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Right. I've seen all the sets at Shepperton and they're not, you know, they're big, but they're not that big, but the blimp hanger North of London is way big enough to do it. And so I, you know, I, I believe that he faked the moon landings. It's the blimp hanger. And then later the blimp hanger became a movie studio as if, um, you know, he had paved the way for that. Mm. And also, oh, also um, I believe that Kubrick um, had a hand in directing um, the movie with Peter Sellers. Um, what's it called? Um, being there. Being there. I believe that yeah, Kubrick. I heard that. Maybe I heard it from you, but I did hear that. Yeah, no, I, I, there's a scene in the movie where Peter Sellers is walking around Washington, D.C. It's a complete throwaway scene, ridiculous scene, lasts for about four minutes, and he's looking in shop windows while walking around uh, Washington, D.C., and in the background is Diodato's 2001 theme, jazz movie theme, and then right when the music goes into the famous, you know, Thus Spoke Zarathustra theme, da, 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 Right. That's right. When Peter Sellers looks through the window and sees a whole model of Apollo, there's an astronaut, there's the capsule, there's the moon. And, and, and there's no way. There's no way. It's a perfect coincidence. And, right. and I believe what I heard was that the director, his name, I forget now. Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby uh, had a drug problem. This is what I yeah, heard. He, did. Yeah. he had a drug problem and Peter Sellers was freaking out and I called up Stanley and said, can you take over the realm of this, oh. the helm of this movie? And, um, and, and Kubrick did. I mean, I, I believe it. I believe that Hollywood knows all this. Uh, from Wag the Dog with Stanley, Dustin Hoffman playing a director named Stanley, faking incidences, um, to being there, there's a lot of references in Hollywood movies that Hollywood knows all of this and they and that they know that Kubrick is much more than a film director. And I'm not going to say any more than that. And I will say this. I believe that they started using film directors after Kubrick to do a lot of events and um, a lot of events that we think are real are not real. They're faked. And uh, they're so well faked that we can't tell what is real and what isn't anymore. Right. Well, that's certainly central to the agenda is just to uh, impair that faculty within all human beings so we just can't tell anymore and stop caring, I think. Uh, out, of, out of curiosity, because um, I know Dave McGowan, he wrote the, um, what was it called? Wagging the Moon Doggy? What was his? Yeah, story? Wagging the Moon Doggy. Yeah. Right. Uh, what did he think about the idea of Kubrick being involved? He, he agrees. Does, does he, it? Yeah. He um he and I had several long conversations about The Shining, and two thousand one, and um, and he thought that um, he thought that Kubrick was intelligence. He thought that he was being used by intelligence agencies. He thought that he had worked at he was the one that pointed out to me that the Mount Outlook Hotel, okay, so where the, stu where the studio, the secret studio, film studio in Laurel Canyon, where it was located, originally there was a hotel there called the Mount Outlook Hotel, okay? And it looks just like the hotel that's in The Shining, which is the Overlook Hotel. OK, so Mount Outlook was a secret uh, studio in Hollywood where they made more films than any other studio and uh, shot more film. They had their own processing lab. They had their own special effects department. Literally, it was all underground. It's now owned by Jared Leto, the actor. Uh, right. he is, but now and he's. I'm not going to say anything, but uh, anyway. Uh, and I believe that that that's uh, not a coincidence. And when I was talking to um, Leon Vitali, 
Um, I, he was telling me all about how Kubrick sent me all over the United States. I had to take pictures of all these hotels and the carpets and the walls and the outside. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I went to like a hundred hotels across the United States and spent me like three months doing this. He said, then when I finally got to the one in Oregon on Mount Hood, and I took those pictures and sent them to Kubrick, Kubrick came back and said, that's it. Stop. We don't have to, we found the place. You don't have to go any further. And I always thought how weird that the one hotel that looks like the hotel that's on Mount Outlook is the one that Kubrick chose as the hotel to be featured in The Shining. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I'm curious to to ask um, on the moon thing, uh, if you agree that in the scene in Diamonds Are Forever with the fake the moon thing, if the director who's saying, that's not a toy, if that sounds to you like Stanley Kubrick. I think, it, yeah, I do. I do. I really think that. I think... Uh, you know, what? why is that scene in the movie? I mean... <laughs> well, it's no obvious reason. No. It's like, yeah, there's, these movies have these throwaway scenes that tell you everything. And, you know, it's a Bond movie. And by the way, I believe that, yeah, the uh, very first movie to be filmed at the hangar, at the, at the uh, blimp hangar, after Kubrick, was um, the uh, uh, Ian Fleming uh, book, uh, what was it called? Um, it was not a spy movie, but it was an Ian, Ian Fleming book. Uh, I forget the name of it now. It had a really weird name, like Ipsy Tipsy something. But that was the first movie that was filmed at the Blimp Hanger officially. Okay, and it was an Ian Fleming book. And so we have this weird link between uh, Ian Fleming and James Bond and Kubrick and uh the whole thing and again the james bond movies are pretty uh revealing too so mm -hmm. i think that you've really tapped into this thing that i i I've, I've been walking around it and looking at it it's kind of out of focus and but the it's there are so many links between all of these disparate subjects and filmmakers that it, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's a cultural, um, a, on purpose cultural manipulation of us. And I think that Kubrick and Spielberg and a few others are at the helm of this cultural manipulation to whose end I have no idea. Yeah, well, um... I mean, I don't know if I have a unified theory about that. Maybe I do, but uh, I mean, my as as you know, if you read Kubrickon, my my view of Kubrick's involvement in the moon landing is 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 less literal than your reading. It's that he was aware, he was consulted, he was aware that the footage was fake, and so on. Um, but that rather than being directly involved, he was directly involved in creating the, the, the myth of being directly involved as part of this larger Kubrickon of generating obsession and theories and and endless looking into looking for clues and so on. That seems consistent with Kubrick's MO and it also seems consistent with these weird clues such as it if was that Stanley Kubrick in Diamonds Are Forever or was, was it just an actor who had the similar kind of nasal New York voice say for example but or, or your what you discovered in The Shining like is that a confession or is that I mean it could be both or is that deliberately intended to to generate this myth that of course makes him even more of a mythical film director not only did he make all these masterpieces but he also faked the moon landing uh when i look at the moon landing footage i think that can't have been kubrick because it doesn't look good enough it just looks so <laughs> shitty <laughs> i love that i really do i really do like that because I mean, kubrick would have been too intelligent to make those stupid mistakes <laughs> um yeah. rodney asher the director of room 237 agrees with you i think from my discussions with rodney he thinks that it was more like what you're saying, that Kubrick, uh, the rumors were already going that he had done the moon land landings long before The Shining started production. Um, Bill Casing, I believe, was the first person to come out with it in maybe 72, maybe 73. 
And I talked to Bill Casing and a long conversation with him. He definitely thought Kubrick was the force behind the moon landings. But it could be that Kubrick just heard the rumors, thought they were quite amusing, and then, you know, revamped The Shining to make it look like he had done it. Well, I wouldn't quite. I mean, that's too far on the other extreme because I certainly think the footage is fake. And I certainly think Kubrick would be one of the people who was was in on it to some degree or, or another. So, yeah, I wouldn't go all the way to the kind of nothing to see here, just a prank thing, more in somewhere in the middle. I yeah, guess, uh, I'd agree. I I. I... I think that um, here, here there's other things that with the Apollo moon landings, and I'll, I'm going to end this here soon. I appreciate you being on. But um, uh, there's a famous, you can probably Google it, uh, type in Apollo moon landing uh, a Polaroid photo. I think you'll find it then. But sitting on the on the uh, lander of the of the lunar lander on the uh, leg, is a photo, very famous photo of two Polaroids sitting on the moon lander. Um, can't really see what's in the Polaroids, but they're there. But Kubrick was well known to go onto the set and take Polaroids before he shot, so he could see how everything looked. Okay, nobody, no other director did that. <clears throat> Polaroid, if you put two Polaroid pictures in the 250 degree environment of the moon, they would uh, quickly, uh, uh, curl up and uh, and and dry out immediately. So they, there's no way that Polaroids could last on the surface of the moon. Period. It would not last. It's dubious that even humans could last on on the surface of the moon. But right. somebody put two Polaroids on the moon landing leg and took a picture of it, and that's part of the record. And that yeah. tells me that that was Kubrick, and he was giving you his signature. But I do agree with you that there are incongruities in the moon landing footage which would indicate that whoever did it really didn't know what they were doing <laughs> well, and that begs the question like what this is, the, these agendas are so subtle to my mind i mean we're talking about think tanks that have mapped human consciousness and cognition for so for decades if not centuries there's so much subtlety here. So, uh, for, I mean, it does beg the question, was the moon landing footage intentionally, obviously fake in such a way that they could further push this rift in the human psyche, whereby more and more people, we saw it in 2020 with the whole COVID thing, they would actually deny and go against the evidence of their senses in order to follow the science, in order to uh, comply with what authority was telling them was real. Because if you have, yeah, if, if all of your senses are telling you one thing and the voice of the wizard in your ear is telling you the other, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, and you and you align with that voice, then you, you, you're becoming more and more you're just giving over your cognitive faculties more and more to, to an inner voice of illegitimate I, authority. I actually have a, a, a personal experience which uh, exemplifies this. I was, let's see, 15, 16. I, watched, I was maybe 15 or 16 when I saw the moon landings. And a whole family gathered around the the television to watch the moon landings. And we're all, oh, wow, this is amazing, right? And my grandfather <clears throat> was getting angrier and angrier at us all. And mm -hmm. finally, he stood up and screamed out, you guys believe this bullshit? This is mm -hmm. so fake, I can't believe it. And my grandfather was not a... a technical guy didn't understand movies or cinema or anything he was an engineer um and i remember looking at him and going how can he say that how can he say that this is fake look at the guys on the moon how can he say this and i realized that because of his age that he probably wasn't as mind controlled as we were who we were all brought up on television and movies and i don't even think he watched television or movies at all and um, he saw it, and, and and now when you look at it, of course, it looks completely fake. Um, can't even believe that anyone thought it was real. Um, I have all of the moon landing uh, footage uh, on DVD, and uh, it's worse than Star Trek, 1960 Star Trek. It's worse than that. I mean, it's terrible. It's terrible. 
You can actually see the, the stage line. You can see the props in the background. You can see the fake lighting. You can see the wires on the astronauts. And by the way, there's a new movie coming out, Fly Me to the Moon, uh, with, uh, what's her name, Scarlett Johansson. And it's all about this. It's, it's coming out like in a month. And it's all about this. It's all about how they had to fake the moon landings because of technical reasons. And it's a comedy. It's hilarious. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of the trailer, um, the the uh, in a trailer, you always have the end of the trailer is your best line in the movie. All right. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the trailer, Scarlett, you can see the astronauts are falling over and cameras are being knocked over. And and it's like a buffoonery on, on of a large scale. At the very end of the trailer, which I recommend everybody watch, Scarlett Johansson looks over at the, her assistant and goes, maybe we should have hired Stanley. Mm. So, so they're saying that they didn't hire Stanley in the movie, that they hired somebody else. Mm. But it's interesting that it's now kind of coming out. And, uh, and I think that your book is like super needed because... I have no doubt in my mind, I have a lot of evidence that Kubrick was fashioning himself as the world's greatest filmmaker and that he went out of his way for the to do this. And you point out in your book about all the ways that he censored people who cri uh, criticized him. Uh, he, he did things that no other filmmaker ever did. And, and, and that's why I highly recommend that everyone read your book because you point out all these incongruities of how could Stanley have so much power to pull a clockwork orange from England, to stop a book from being published that criticized his films. And uh, nobody, nobody else has ever had that power since, or I don't think will ever again, nor do they have the power to make any film they want to make. That's the other thing that has to be pointed out. I mean, you know, Kubrick had carte blanche really to make anything he wanted. And Except for Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, you pointed out how they could control him by releasing films that they didn't want him to make before he made them. <laughs> and that film with uh, Rod Steiger, Waterloo. Yeah, and Schindler's List. Yeah. Atrocious movie. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. All right, well, listen, um, Jason, it's been really good to have you on. And um, I'm glad I... I, I I brought you on to kind of clear the air. I wanted people to understand that I'm not this crazy Kubrick aficionado that everyone thinks I am. I do think that his films are technically incredible. And I'm a kind of a technical guy, so that's where my appreciation for Kubrick comes from. I think he was terrible with actors. I think your quote from Robert Duvall of the worst acting he's ever seen is in Kubrick films is actually accurate. And I think that your dad saying that Spartacus was his best movie. <laughs> I actually think I can actually see why someone would say that. I actually can. I can actually see why someone would think that Spartacus is Kubrick's best movie. Definitely the best acting. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a bit like your grandfather in the moon landing, you know, whether or not they were right. I think in, in, in your case, your grandfather was definitely onto something. Uh, whether or not my father was right, it did help to prevent a spell taking hold, like yes. falling care, like having my father just say, well, I don't believe the hype about Kubrick. You know, Spartacus is better than all these big, you know, art, arty films that later he got credit for because it was just a good old fashioned entertainment. Uh, it's, it, you know, that's very uh essentially you say about you know you've got these viewers who think that you're a Kubrick aficionado because I was assuming that most of your viewers themselves would be that and uh it's good to know if they're not because it's it's very difficult to that the, the spell has been so effectively created around Kubrick that it's very difficult to break it and to actually talk sensibly about what's going on um so yeah, I mean, that's my main uh, aim with the Kubrickon, besides using an example to look at a much larger thing, but specifically around Kubrick is just, just look at the emperor's clothes, you know, are they really what we think they are, or is he actually bollock naked? Because that, to me, the 
um, I mean, I took very early on, I took about how Kubrick films, the idea that you have to watch them over and over again to get them, that's a sign like you have to smoke a cigarette over and over again. You have to take heroin more than once. So like, that's a bad sign. That's not necessarily a good sign. No, well, that's so, right. Part of my driving. System, it's yeah. called psychic driving in uh, in the mind control program. Right. Cogn so I call it cognitive impairment. That yeah. there's a that mo a movie like a Kubrick movie that you have to sort of rewire your cognitive hardware in order to get it. That's colonizing your consciousness. Eyes wide shut is is the the oh. the best example of that because it's so obviously a really bad movie. I will stand. You know, I'll die on that hill. It's a terrible movie, but people have rewired them themselves by watching it over and over again and reading the criticism and somehow they convince themselves that it's a masterpiece it's certainly i think it's an intentionally bad movie but this is my point anyway that kubrick was doing something else that had to do with trying to infiltrate our cognition and harness it and harvest it and so on anyway mm -hmm. sorry i didn't mean to go off on one we're trying to wind up but yeah. just back to my father and spartacus and just sometimes we just need an ordinary uh, you know, non-educated voice just to say, hold on, sorry, I cry bullshit. I, I agree with that. And uh, yeah, I think there is a, a direct connection between what your father saw and what my grandfather saw. And, uh, and, and I can actually, in retrospect, I actually w am, am now raising Spartacus up to a higher degree. And I think now it actually is one of Kubrick's best movies. And that and Paths of Glory. And I and I wonder how much, because Paths of Glory and Spartacus have the best acting of all Kubrick movies. I'm actually wondering how much Kirk Douglas had to do with uh, those two movies and maybe influencing the actors because Kubrick could not direct actors. I'm sorry. He just, I don't even think he liked actors, to be honest with you. Malcolm McDowell told me that he and Kubrick were like tight close buddies all through the shooting of Clockwork Orange and that the day that he finished doing the narration for Clockwork Orange he never saw or talked to Stanley ever again wow. so, yeah he thought that Stanley had contempt for him mm. so I think Stanley did have contempt for actors I really do I mean, Hitchcock did too by the way so it's not it's something that normal it's not it's not that abnormal for a director to have contempt for the actors Particularly if they're fascinated by just the technical aspects. Yeah, and both Hitchcock and, and Kubrick were technical guys, yeah, yeah. right? And so the actors were like, eh, why do I even have to deal with these people, right? Yeah, well, the, the, the human element is the hardest to control. Yes, it is, especially when you're a control freak like Kubrick and Hitchcock. All right, Jason, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I think that uh, it's really good to clear the air about Stanley Kubrick and get a whole different kind of point of view on him. Um, I certainly, since reading your book, have thought about his films in a completely different way. I was there almost anyway, but I think your book kind of pushed me over the top and I went, ah. Right. Oh, great right. well i'm happy i mean if it if it if it's saved one person from kubrophilia then you know it's done its job <laughs> you'd almost say that he's kind of the anti-filmmaker yeah in a way it was like i'm going to make films that are so difficult for people to watch you know kind of the opposite of spielberg who makes films that are easy to watch right well, they're sort of complimentary, though. So yeah, I don't particularly care for Spielberg either, unless it's Jaws or something. But but I mean, just to wind up again, uh, my view of Kubrick is is that he he wasn't really interested in just making films that were entertaining, uh, even as art, if you know what I mean. Like he was interested in something that transcended, in quotes, films, and so his films have that portentous sort of weight and heaviness to them. That doesn't you know, to me. It doesn't appeal. I like a film like Jaws or The Wild Bunch or something that is good pulp entertainment, but transcends the thing. But with Kubrick, my thesis is he really wasn't that interested in in the film product itself. He was in, he was after a much bigger game, and that was essentially human consciousness and high level socio cultural engineering that kind of game. And I don't think you can really be uh, pursuing that agenda 
um, and uh, really have the best interests, your own best interests or the best interests of human beings at heart. I mean, I don't, I just don't know, but I think it's pretty much impossible to be trying to operate at that level and really stay connected to, to what's good and true and meaningful. I think that that's a great analysis. I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I think that um, he was part of a growing milieu that came out of the intelligence agencies in the 1950s and they recognized his talent and they harvested him and brought him in. And he became from uh, probably Dr. Strangelove on as a, a gigantic social engineering project. And he kind of admits it somewhere. I can't remember what interview later in life he was being interviewed. I think it was after Full Metal Jacket. And he says that he, I, I can't find the interview anymore, but he says that um, he's his films are dedicated to social consciousness, something like that. And yeah. I thought, well, that's a strange thing to say. I mean, I think that my films would be, be uh, you know, uh, towards telling a good story. But he actually said, no, they're towards creating social consciousness, which agrees with what you're saying. And I do believe that that's actually what's going on. And it's kind of a, he's kind of, uh, I'm going to tell you the truth, but not really, over and over again. Yeah, that's why people can't leave them alone. Right, it's the anomaly that if you can't solve it, you just keep going back to it. Yep, you're right. And it's all done on purpose. A very, very kind of a chess move from a chess player. Yeah. All right, Jason. Well, okay. thank you on Reality Check. I really appreciate it. And everybody, thanks for watching. And uh, keep watching. I got a whole bunch of really interesting stuff coming up. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yep. Bye-bye.